So thank you everyone for joining uh, today's workshop. We are Tunis, our user group. And uh, this amazing group so uh, aims to provide the friendly support network for our enthusiasts in Tunisia and worldwide. Uh, this group was the dream of three amazing women, our women actually. So we are women who love programming with R. And uh, this is uh, a volunteer run organization. The co-founder are uh, Mune Belaid, business intelligence consultant, Amal Tlili, data science engineer, and myself, Hejat Nani, I'm a bioinformatician and data analyst. So we were based in Tunisia and we had this amazing dream, like to provide uh, free workshops and to build a community around, uh, around the R uh, programming language. Uh, last year, we had the chance to have with us uh, Amal Bukteb, uh, which is uh, an aspiring bioinformatician. So uh, she joined us to organize, to be a co-organizer co uh, in our bioinformatics event and data science also events. The code of conduct uh, is very simple. Actually, a Tunis R user group is dedicated to be providing a respectful, harassment-free community for everyone. We do not tolerate harassment or bullying of, a, of, of any community member in any form. And please, let's keep this place a welcoming and friendly community for everyone. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Don't hesitate yet to, if you don't understand something, to let us know, to put, you know, it's like to ask in the chat. And we are here to help you to understand and to learn together. Uh, that's the aim of this community, learning together and growing together. So thank you, yeah, for joining us today. We have we have already organized many uh, like our workshops previously, and you can see this content on our uh, YouTube channel. So don't hesitate if you want to learn about bioinformatics or data science to go to our YouTube channel or our uh, workshops are there. And uh, today we have the honor to have with us James. So he will teach us how to build the chatbot with OpenAI, Chinese and R. So thank you James for accepting uh, our invitation. And uh, James is a research scientist working in the chemicals and materials science industry, where he combines the power of data science with chemistry and material science. His current projects focus on uh, augmenting materials characterization innovations with statistical analysis, machine learning, and data visualization. James enjoys contributing to a growing data science community both in and outside of work and is a passionate advocate of open source uh, data science. So if you have uh, any comment or question, please uh, leave your message in uh, the YouTube chat or here uh, in the Zoom chat. And uh, so this uh, Zoom has been sponsored by Epsilon. Please uh, visit Epsilon uh, blog and YouTube channel. I myself uh, learned so much from their blog and YouTube channel. So please don't hesitate. If you want to learn about Chinese dashboard, data science, machine learning, our open source and uh, community news. So go and have a look at their blog. And we thank them so much for sponsoring uh, our Zoom. And thank you so much. So now uh, we will let, I will stop sharing and we will let uh, our ladies room to present, you know, their community. So we are very happy to have them with us today. Thank you. Thank you, hello everyone. Hi, Heidia. So thank you very much for organizing this. Uh... Federica, I think we lost you. Oh. 
So let's wait like a few minutes for Federica to join. Yeah, okay. So uh oh, oh, it's we fine lost. because I'm not yeah, we lost um, you, with the, Yeah, I see. Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> Um, right. Okay, so um, thank you very much for this for organizing this event. And what about our ladies' room? Let's see if I can share a couple of uh, uh, slides just to... Can I share uh, something yeah. or otherwise? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, you uh, can share. Uh, I made you already co-host. Okay. Okay, um, as you can see, uh, so this is our website, and uh, uh, we are um, uh, a very young group, uh, a chapter that is uh, been created uh, uh, in uh, 2022, uh, but actually started uh, organizing event in 2023. So we just ended our uh, first year. Uh, and started with um, um, uh, some uh, a partnership with Our Ladies Paris. So today we have a partnership with Tunis Art Users Group. So our, we are quite happy about those things. Um, so our uh, yeah, so the interest of our uh, event is quite so growing uh, very well. Uh, what about us? Just uh, very uh, quickly, you can find us everywhere on the social media. Uh, my name is Federica Gazzelloni, uh, and I am the lead organizer of uh, Ladies Room. Um, so this teacher, and actually I'm an independent researcher and, um, involved in a couple of uh, you know projects. Uh, we have uh, some co-organizers, uh, uh, Francesca Bigone, uh, she is as well a nurturing professional uh, within the risk management uh, and um, in the energy sector. Uh, and then other, uh, you know, past co-organizers, but they still with us and we are very happy to uh, welcome uh, a new uh, co-organizer. Uh, so you will see about her, uh, Silvana Costa. Uh, you will see about her uh, soon. Uh, because uh, on the 20, we have Shannon Pileggi uh, with the buggy in R. Uh, and so we will introduce her formally. This is all for us. So thank you very much. Uh, for for uh, organizing this event and um, uh, I'll pass the word to you. Thank you, Federica. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, James, uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation and the screen is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I think the link to today's content is already put in the chat. Might be good to put it in maybe one more time if somebody doesn't mind, just in case some some of the latecomers didn't catch it. Um, this covers everything that I'll be talking through today, as well as links to the slides that I'll be going through as well. So my goal for today is to talk, hopefully, uh, as little as possible and give you a chance to start using some of the tools and capabilities that I'll be talking about. And I, I'd love to hear all of your questions as we go through this. I'm going to start by pro providing an overview of generative AI tools within our studio. Uh, and then the second part will be all about building a chatbot, which hopefully we can do um, interactively together. So if you don't want to listen to me and you just want to go get started, uh, this link right here to build a chatbot will help you uh, go ahead and get to all these materials so you can start coding right away. And I will jump over now. So <clears throat> there's two sets of slides today, like I mentioned. Um, and I, I'd like to, to start off by giving you an overview of, of how you could actually go and use um, more or less off the shelf generative AI tools in our studio today. Um, the, I also should mention that you'll see a number of images as we go throughout the presentation. All of these are AI generated um, and we're mostly done with the Copilot, Microsoft's Copilot, uh, which is has a Dolly 3 in the background. Now, uh, 
you you heard al- already that uh, I'm I'm from Michigan, and I wanted to give give ask the AI to generate what uh, what the, the the difference between what I imagine I'm living in in Michigan. If I look out my window right now, I can see lots of snow, and I don't think this is actually what it looks like right now in Tunisia. But in my mind, this is this is looking nice and warm and much better than the cold, frigid climate that I'm in right now. I also want to mention that my life has been a little bit chaotic through the last few months as I welcomed uh, newborn twins into my life back in uh, the, on the last day of September last year. Uh, so when I got the invite to come talk, I was really excited, but had no idea when I was going to have time to put this together. Uh, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity, and I'm excited to share uh, what I have today. Now, when you think about uh, generative AI, it's we're, we're probably at the peak of, of, say, the hype cycle for, for what these tools happen to be. Um, it could be uh, the, the capabilities are, are amazing, um, but it, unlike this image, uh, is, isn't actually magic. And so I hope as you see, as I talk through some of these tools today, that this is something that you can use today. You can build capabilities on top of, and this is something that can make you a much more productive uh, say researcher, uh, maybe scientist, statistician, uh, data analyst, business analyst. I'm sure we have lots of different roles represented today. And I, again, I, I, these generative AI tools, despite all of the hype around them, are very practically useful tools that we can take advantage of to make our lives easier as we write our code or build solutions with our code. There are three main ways that you can use Gen AI tools within our studio. The first of which, <clears throat> that has gotten a lot of focus lately is GitHub Copilot. So this is a commercial tool. You have to pay in order to use this. But once you <clears throat> pay this money to GitHub, you actually can integrate GitHub Copilot directly into our studio to assist you in, in your coding. And I'll show you some examples of that as we go through. Probably what I'm most excited about, although I'm biased because I'm con- I've been building a lot of these tools, is the use of RStudio add-ins through packages like GPT Studio, Chatter, and GPT Tools. You'll see some examples of those as well. I maintain both GPT Studio and GPT Tools. So if you have suggestions, features, complaints, I'd love to hear about it uh, as, as you start using some of these tools if you haven't already. Lastly, there are these wrapper packages that take existing um, APIs. Most of what we'll be talking about today is using OpenAI, uh, and the packages here are, are unsurprisingly called OpenAI, and then also Chatter and GPT Studio are wrappers around these as well. These give us access to more than just OpenAI, including things like local models that you can run directly on your own computers. If you haven't heard about GitHub Copilot integration within our studio already, I really encourage you to go see or go watch uh, Tom Mock's talk. He's the um, product manager of the Posit Workbench suite of tools, including our studio Workbench, and really gives a fantastic overview, some of which I borrowed for today's <clears throat> uh, talk so that um, you can see what some of these capabilities really are. He had some really good advice, Tom did, on how to go and use some of these generative AI tools. Um, the first is to remember that we're not talking about general intelligence or, or, or a brain that's rationalizing giving you responses. It really is, is a massive model. We're talking billions, or in the case of GPT-4, trillions of parameters. It's almost unimaginably large, uh, some of these models happen to be. Even though they're really highly capable, it's not always the right solution for us to use, and we don't always get the response that we might want out of them. I'm sure many of you have heard of things like hallucinations, uh, where the the AI model will generate suggestions of code snippets that don't actually exist, where it imagines functionality that, that are out there. So anytime we're looking at code that's been generated by one of these AI models, we really need to make sure that we're validating the output of those before we go and use them, and especially before we go and put something like this into production. What Where we can use this is to experiment, to get new ideas, or maybe understand what the more probable or the more common approaches to using some of these tools happen to be. If you haven't experimented with, with these yet, this is best done just from your own practice. So again, a, a key message here is if you haven't tried some of these tools out, I, I really hope you'll, you'll use some of what you learned here today to go to go get started and try them for yourself. So Copilot, uh, if, if this is new to you, 
really what we're talking about here is a um, a highly sophisticated autocomplete style suggestion uh, where you'll see, say, what's called ghost text on the screen. Right as you're typing along, the model will make recommendations as you're coding, and then you can just tab complete to accept those suggestions and, and continue on with your coding journey. Now, it's worthwhile to directly compare autocomplete versus copilot. So autocomplete is looking at what's in your existing code, what's in your existing environment. It might suggest something like a function that's in a package that you've already loaded in your environment. Copilot's very similar to that, although it also has the massive amount of training data. A lot of open source code or accessible code on GitHub uh, has, has been included in, in, the in the training set for these models. You can get com the completion portion of this is, is quite similar. You just get a suggestion, you can tab, and then you'll, the suggestion now becomes part of your existing code. You For autocomplete, the suggestions are uh, relatively static. You're, you're going to get the same autocomplete every single time uh, when you have the same set of code within your, within your file itself. Copilot, uh, being a generative model, is going to ha have different suggestions uh, each time. And so this can be good and bad. It can help you think of or see other ways to solve a particular problem. Uh, but this is where things like the hallucinations of functions can, can pop in. Um, the the last thing to, to point out here is that when you're just using autocomplete, you can turn your internet off and it'll have the exact same experience. With Copilot, it's it's making API API calls to a um, <clears throat> Microsoft or GitHub hosted model. Um, so you are talking about things leaving your your workstation as you're writing your own code. So this is best shown just from looking at some of the the examples here. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen this autocomplete style before. The, the co-pilot aspects of this, it looks quite similar, except you're seeing um, more as well. I just got a note that something changed in my microphone. So if you're not hearing me, please let me know. <laughs> Hopefully nothing changed on your end. Um, okay, so here's an, is an, uh, a short video showing uh, co-pilot in action. Um, th this experience, uh, when it gets it right, can feel almost somewhat magical, uh, where you just get, instead of a couple of words, you can get a lot of suggestions coming out of this. Um, the, the biggest downside to Copilot is that, it, it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it it isn't free. You actually have to pay in order to use this. Um, the, the only caveat to that is that if you contribute to open source projects on GitHub, um, GitHub has been offering open source maintainers free access to GitHub Copilot. So um, that is a nice thing that they're doing, but for the majority of people, you will have to pay in order to use this service. Okay, so now let's talk about some packages that you can use. I was mentioning those before. We're talking about these RStudio add-ins uh, that come from open source packages that you can go and install and start using today. Uh, I'll, I'll first highlight GPT Studio. Uh, this, is, this is a bit of a passion project of mine. Um, where it effectively is is trying to bring a chat GPT like experience inside of the the R Studio IDE. Um, there's a number of other features in it as well, but that chat interface is the primary component of it. What this looks like is you can just use a uh, by hitting a hotkey or just launching an app. Uh, you'll have access to a chat prompt where you can ask questions, copy code, um, and try to get assistance without having to navigate away from the uh, RStudio IDE. It has integrations with a large number of models. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, has integrations with a large number of models and services, including uh, Google's Gemini models, um, the any <clears throat> just about any model you can download from Hugging Face, uh, Anthropic, Cohere. Uh, there, uh, there's a ton of uh, options that are available out there. Uh, and can can it'll be a little bit overwhelming. One of the cooler new features that we now have is you can use uh, local models. So uh, you don't actually have to hit uh, an external service. You can run them right on your computer and get code suggestions uh, and have that chat interface directly on your on with within our studio. So if you have things like privacy concerns, this could be a really good option for you. Chatter is a very similar package to GPT Studio. Uh, this is. The maintainer of this is Edgar Ruiz from Posit. Uh, he also works on, if any of you, of you use the Sparkly R package or Sparkler, um, he is the, I believe, the maintainer of that package as well. 
Uh, he has a couple of additional features that I think are worth pointing out. Uh, the interface here is is somewhat similar. Um, the, operationally, it, it's, it, it is uh, comparable to what you would get from GPT Studio. But he also has some some capabilities of adding in components from your from your uh, existing environment. So maybe if you have a data frame loaded in, um, you could add that as part of what the prompt that goes into your model. If you haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, if you haven't uh, experimented much with these before, and things like prompts are a new concept for you, don't worry. Once we actually get to the chatbot building phase, you'll see more th more of this than maybe you you want want to see. Um, but again, the, this prompt and response is the is the main interaction modality for how how we can use some how we can use these models. Uh, the last package that I'll point out is called GPT Tools. This is a sister package to GPT Studio uh, that used to have a, a clear distinction between the two. Uh, this one I would say is mostly where I am using a an experimental space uh, for what features we we could add into a. Um, chat-based or, or, or AI-based package. Um, and one of the features that I'm most excited about right now is something that hopefully looks like a, a video that you saw on a couple slides back. Uh, you can now actually create your own ghost text so you can get your own code suggestions using GPT tools. So if you if you aren't paying for GitHub Copilot, you actually can, can use GPT tools and an API key from OpenAI to go ahead and have a very similar experience as you would with, with GitHub Copilot. From some initial experimentation, it has some good and bad features compared to this the, to the paid tool. Um, and I, I am excited to continue to build this out as well. Something I won't have time to go into today that GPT Tools also does is uh, you can actually create your own, uh, uh, you can sc scrape things like packages, websites, PDF documents, and create indices. So you can do retrieval augmented or generation or RAG, where you can bring some context into the, the chat experience and get some more reliable uh, results out of that. Uh, it, this is a bit more of an advanced topic. I'd be happy to talk more about that towards the end if we have some time. Um, but again, the GPT tools package is where I like to add new features. So uh, if you want to, if, if you see a missing capabilities, you start using these tools. I'd love to hear about that, particularly on the issues pages of the GPT tools package. So with that, I'd like to pause to see if there's any questions, comments, anything like that before we actually get into the, the, the fun part of today. I intentionally went through all of that uh, quickly. Uh, so I'm happy to, to, to answer any clarification. And if not, we can go ahead and get straight into the building phase. All right, I think you're just yeah. excited to go ahead and start building something. No question on the chat. So it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I do have the chat up, but if I miss something, please just let me know. Okay. So let's dive in into actually building this chatbot. The critical to this is making API calls. If you've never made API calls before, this actually is a is a really good way to learn how to how to use packages like Hitter, HTTR, or Hitter2. Uh, the a a um, new version of of the hitter package, and I, I think it's a nice way to learn because it's really fun to make some of these these calls once you actually get these things working. Here's an example uh, from the OpenAI documentation of what an API call looks like. If you're like me, this is somewhat gibberish. It's intimidating. I don't really know what to do with this. Fortunately, ChatGPT can help a lot with translating uh, what this might mean into uh, hitter-based API calls. But today, I want to step through how we can go and create a pipeline to call this API using hitter, hitter2 or HTTR2. The one, one piece in particular I want to emphasize is we have to give the model something. We have to submit something to the model in order to get our response back. And that, for the OpenAI model, it falls under this messages category. So there's going to be two main components that, that we pass. Um, this is the JSON structure of that. If you're new to JSON, this is a very common structure uh, for passing internet data on, on the internet. Uh, and <clears throat> it takes a little bit getting used to, but in, you can easily represent this structure with nested lists inside of R. 
Um, you'll be managing lots of parentheses to, in order to do that, but uh, it's not too bad once you've done it a few times. The com key components that we have here <clears throat> are a model. This specifies which specific model from OpenAI we want to hit, and then the messages. With the latest version of OpenAI API, they introduced roles where you can have system, assistant, and user as the roles, and then each of those have associated content with them. So it's important to remember that this is the structure that, th that the model will accept in order to give us the chat-like experience that I'm sure many of us are used to from using tools like ChatGPT. Okay, so let's get into the, the actual R code that we have here. Um, there's We're gonna be using two packages for this, hitter2, as I mentioned, and then per. Uh, per is part of the tidyverse framework, um, and we'll be using this to clean up some of the responses that we have uh, from the hitter2 response. Okay, so the first step that we're gonna do is recreate that, that message that you just saw, that JSON structure, uh, where we're just going to have a very simple message where you, from the user, all we're doing is saying, hello. We then put this, this list of lists inside of yet another list. I told you we were gonna have lots of nested lists. Um, <clears throat> and we can see this body uh, that is that is then gonna, the body is the key part that we're gonna pass to the API. So let's keep on constructing this out here. With the hitter two package, we have to create this overall, um, this request to send to the API. Specifically, this is called a post request. Uh, and effectively what we're doing here is piecing together bits of the URL, starting with the base URL from the OpenAI API. Um, and all I'm doing is effectively copying uh, from the documentation. Uh, again, I'm gonna jump back just a second to this. So here's this, here's a curl request that you could pass into a terminal. We're just translating this using the um, hitter two package um, in a way that makes it more um, for, for composable and digestible. So we have this basic request. We're just appending to our URL. We will have to pass our OpenAI key. So if you haven't created an OpenAI account, if you want to build alongside with uh, alongside with me, you'll need to go and create one today. We then pass that body element that we created up above, and then the last thing that we have to do for, uh, is to actually send this request off. It'll take maybe a couple of seconds in order to get the response back from this. Um, and then we can process this using a function from the hitter package called res resp or response body JSON. Um, and the structure here, we have to do something kind of funky at the end uh, where we're using this pluck, path, uh, pa pluck function. This is from per, uh, and you'll see why we have to do that in just a moment. So this is <clears throat> can seem like a lot of code just to get a, a simple response back, um, but once we have this, we can re reuse the same form over and over to again to pass really whatever content we want to the model as long as it's text. So here is what we actually get back. So this is before we do any cleanup. And there's a lot of information in here. There's identifiers for the chat that we send off. Uh, they tell there's a date for when we created this. We can see the model that we're using. And then really what we're doing, the reason we have this, this multiple levels of pluck here is we're going into our choices. We want to see the message, and then we want to see the content that's coming out of that. So there could be other useful information that we have coming out from this model. But really, if you're if we're using it as a chat agent or a chat bot, all we really want to know is what did the model say back to our own response. Okay, I'm going to pause there because when you're uh, when when you're writing some of your own code for this, this can be a little bit complicated. Is there any questions that people have about what about this code that we've written so far? Okay. Now, <clears throat> to use this inside of our, our uh, chatbot app, we're going to need to wrap this into a function. This is going to look relatively similar to the code that you just saw. The first couple lines are recreating that message body. We then have this request, and then we process the response. Again, that's message body, request, and processing the response. So let's see what we can actually go and do with this. It's fairly simple. So we have chat, and then we put our, our prompt in there. We can get a response back. 
We can ask for something related to uh, about code. Uh, this is just asking for a simple example with ggplot2. Uh, and you'll notice that you actually often have to co coach these models to stop being so wordy. So what I end up doing here is I add something like only code with comments, please be brief. Um, if you don't do that, you, I, you'll notice that these models can be give you lots and lots of explanations that you don't really care about, especially if you just want to know what the code looks like. Now, both of these responses are kind of ugly, right? This is uh, the direct response from the model uh, printed to the console. This isn't exactly what you want to look at. You have all these like return characters and <clears throat> it just doesn't look very well. So that we can make some easy changes to this um, that can make it more approachable. The simplest one would actually be to just um, cat uh, call to, to our overall response. This is go, this can go directly to, to the console for us. And this looks a little better. You'll, you'll notice that we now have more of a structure here. We're not the, the return characters are actually being reflected. Um, and we can actually go one step above this as well. We can, um, looks like my code chunk actually got cut off here, but we can actually uh, pass the a markdown function from Shiny. So we'll, we'll actually do this when we're building the chat bot itself. Um, and we can get formatted text that's coming out of, of these responses as well. So just as, as, a, as a reminder, what we're doing is we're going from, to jump around on you a little bit, we're going from this JSON structure uh, that originally comes from the model. And with just a few lines of code, we have formatted text that is much easier for us to digest and look at. One piece that um, I'm not going to cover in as much detail today, but is is quite uh, useful for having a, a an effective application or a couple of helper functions that go in and, and create the structures of the prompts um, that, that we'll need as, as we go through this. So we, you already saw a, a version of the chat function. Uh, we'll need to make a couple of adjustments to this uh, to do things like adding our history to this, uh, to maybe even change the prompt that we're sending to the model. Uh, if we can tweak exactly how how, how the model behaves. Uh, the two suggested examples that I have here are maybe just a general chat as well as code. Uh, providing some of that, that uh, language to the model that the, the prompt instructions to the model can be quite useful to direct the model's response. Sometimes you want to code to be explained to you, but sometimes you don't you don't need to have the explanation. A good example of this is you're, if you're working with regular expressions, I don't really care how the regular expression works. I just want it to work. And so I might just say, only give me the regular expression. Don't explain how it works. Uh, we we also want to include the API key as a variable so that we're not just having we're not paying for other people to use our app. Um, and then we can include these uh, these helper functions like constructing our over overall prompt or our system prompt, preparing our prompt. And I have uh, you'll see exactly what both of these are doing in just a moment. So <clears throat> the rest of this function is is uh, uh, exactly what we saw before, constructing our message, constructing the, the hitter two pipeline, and then processing the response coming out of that. The other two system prompts that we have here are uh, providing a uh, the, the system prompt construction. Uh, so you can see that for the general example, what we have here is uh, just, you are a helpful assistant. This is often the default prompt that you'll see in the OpenAI playground. And then I've, I've truncated it just for space reasons, but we could have a specific prompt associated with code. This might be something like, please only answer with code, be concise in your answer. Uh, you might actually want to ask it to only put in any commentary needs to be in commented code, right? And so you could copy and paste directly into your console. Uh, then the, the uh, last helper function here that we'll talk through is how to, how to prepare this prompt. Uh, this can be, this is where we're, we're looking at lists of lists again. Uh, what we're doing here is taking our user message, our system prompt, and our history as inputs. Um, and we're combining those together so that if you ask a, a, a follow-up question to our chat bot, you actually will have the history that ends up being reflected in that. Uh, so you have the system prompt, you have the, the prompt preparation, and you have chat, and we're pretty much ready to go and build. Okay, so... Uh, I have a little bit of a timer here just to keep myself, um, not, not to go too far for this, but 
I actually want to switch over, move from slides to going directly into the RStudio IDE. And I'd like to build this together. Before we do that, um, I want to make sure that if there's any questions about what I've shared so far, um, you can go ahead and ask questions about it. And then I'm also going to jump over to uh, the original page that I shared. So I, I know this has been copied a lot of times, but I'll just put this in the in the chat one more time. Um, <clears throat> if you want to follow along with me as we go through this, the best way that I recommend doing so is to go to that page that I just uh, that I just copied. Um, and you can either clone this directly inside of your RStudio IDE, or uh, what I actually recommend is to use the use this package uh, to to create from GitHub and put this directly into your environment. What I'll do for this is jump over to, oh, it looks like it. Come on. I'm going to jump over to posit cloud. Uh, what I, what I want to make sure of number one is that nothing broke as I was making some last minute changes to this. And this, this is still uh, the best way for you to, to create this project. And if you're unfamiliar with posit cloud, this is actually, I, I think a really fantastic service, uh, that allows you to, uh, really wor do work on just about anything. You don't have, you can work on your iPad. You can really do this from your phone, though the aspect ratio might be a little bit rough. So, oh, great question. I see a question in the chat. So how to reduce hallucinations, um, asking about best practices for that. Yeah, so it, funny enough, you can actually, sometimes you can just ask to, uh, you can ask the model to reflect on its own prompt. So asking it to do things like, um, respond step by step. Uh, the best way though, to avoid hallucinations that I've found is something we won't cover today, uh, which is to bring context along with you. So if you, um, the, the best intuition that I have for how to, how to work with these models is to, is to think of them as language reasoning agents. You could maybe think of them as a very intelligent, uh, maybe 18 year old that is missing lots of context, but is is really, really good at understanding language. And if you have a question about how to write a Shiny app, one of the best things that you can do is to include in that the documentation that's coming from Shiny. That can be a little bit complicated, but something as simple as copying documentation can help with that. Ah, okay, great follow-up. So um, asking about precision here, I think what what you might be referring to uh, <clears throat> to get a more precise response is to is to mess with the temperature parameter. So we I don't have that in the slides, but I can actually show you how we how we could do that um, as we as we go and build build out this chatbot. So fantastic question. Don't stop the questions coming as I'm clicking around. I just want to show you um, if you're working on Posit Cloud. What I did was just create a new project from a GitHub repo, and I'm just copying the, the URL there. Oh, that's not the URL. <laughs> that's why it was erroring. Hold on, let me grab the right one. Actually, I think I have it memorized. Or fortunately, it's right there. So this project uses RMV. If you're new to RMV, uh, what this does is it will... Uh, it has a lock file that has all of the packages that I've been using as I've been building out this project. Once it starts, it will ask you if it can go ahead and initialize the project and it'll install everything into your environment so that you can get started. Ah, okay. I see a question about um, the chat completion API. Yeah, so... Everything that I've done so far has been with the chat completion API endpoint. There is the assistance. Um, I, I haven't noticed a huge difference between the two of them and just from my, my own experimentation. I'm gonna say yes here, by the way, uh, just so it starts installing this for me. Um, the assistant endpoint I expect will be of more interest in the future as, they, as the assistance capabilities get better and better. Uh, for those unfamiliar with this, the chat completions is, is basically a chat bot and the assistance, the intention there is to have something that can be more comprehensive in its ability to solve problems where it might actually have a response, go do something, respond to itself. Uh, if you've used any of the coding integration within chat GPT, where it might run some Python code and then have a response coming back to that, 
uh, that's that's something more of what an assistant would be versus just a just a chat agent. Um, it's still early on that, uh, so I, I think that's that's something we we. Um, uh, it's unclear how useful they'll, they'll end up being from from an API standpoint. I did. I think this was a. a, a I don't think all of you can see this question, but there's also a question about. Um, using these IDEs and what software tools are, are we using here? So this should work with, um, I, I don't think there should be any constraints on using this on Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Um, this should work pretty much across uh, across any, any of the common uh, operating systems. So you'll notice as this is going, this is installing lots of packages. I like to use lots of packages in my own development work. After a couple of minutes, this should, this should, uh, this should complete. You might get a uh, warning that it took a long time to to initialize. I think you can just ignore that for the moment. All right, I'm going to switch over to my R Studio ID, my local one. Um, and we can go ahead and get building this app as soon as I refine my share button. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into the, actually, let me open up the chat app so I can see this again. And I'm going to, I have two examples here. Um, we'll start with the chat bot. If we have time, we can go into the PDF chat. Um, it's a little more complicated, but I will show you what it does. So here's all the code for this. <laughs> Let's try that again. I promise it's not just an empty box. Okay. What we're going to end up building here is um, a simple chat interface. But what we're adding to this, um, if again, if we have time to go build something like this out, is a... is an app that can actually ingest a PDF. So I just uploaded a scientific publication uh, to this app. I need to go and grab my API key. Give me just a second. And... Okay, so I just copied an API key. I didn't let you see it because I, I uh, shouldn't do that, but I'm going to copy it into this component here. And now that we have an API key, this app should work. So what it's gonna do is create a embeddings from this uh, PDF that we just uploaded. And now what I'll do is we can ask this chatbot to say, what are the key findings from the paper? So you notice that intentionally there, I was actually somewhat vague. Um, I just said the paper. So if, if this was just a normal chatbot, I wouldn't really know anything about it. Uh, but because we've added some contextualization from the embeddings that we just created, uh, we can actually get an answer that tells us, okay, this paper is about um, these uh, polydiketoenamine uh, elastomers. So if you're not in the chemistry field or the materials science field, that probably doesn't mean much to you. Uh, but you can see that we get a tailored answer based off the document that we just shared. And I could ask, what is the single most novel finding from the paper? And it's talking about the architectural design of these dynamic covalent PDK elastomers. I won't read all of that to you, um, but this is actually something that we can build relatively easily. You can upload multiple PDFs if you would like for this as well. Um, and we have the ability to, in addition to ha having our key in here, uh, we can change models, we can change the task, uh, and we have 
again, uh, the, the, the ability to chat with any document, any PDF document that we go and share with it. Okay, so before we get into to that, that uh, PDF chatbot, I wanna go back to our original chatbot. There should be a file in the repo if you've had a chance to clone it yourself with app start here. So that would be shiny chat chatbot app start here. <clears throat> so I um I want to pause there and see is it does anybody have questions about um the getting access to these resources following along with what I'm doing so far? Ah, okay. So asking about exporting this to to an Excel file that that doesn't exist in the app that, today, but that's certainly something that you could that you could include. You would have to code it yourself, or if we have time, we could maybe talk about how to design something like that in a in a bit. I did see. Okay, there was a question about the resources. I'm betting that's somebody who joined a little bit late. There's the, I just pasted the link in there. All right. Okay. So let's actually go ahead and get started with uh, building this chatbot. Uh, I have a, the, the start here app. The purpose of this is just so you have the basic framework of a shiny app, especially if you're new to shiny. Um, I won't be covering the uh, basics of shiny. <laughs> excuse me, the basics of Shiny today. But if you have questions about any of the particular pieces that I'm talking about, I'm happy to talk through those. Just, just please put a message in the chat. I have a number of different packages that we've already loaded here. Uh, most of these are either from the Shiny ecosystem or from Tidyverse. And I also have some helper functions. Um, you'll notice that these are much more annotated than they were on the slides, but it's the same, overall the same functions that we're looking at here. Um, the API calls, preparing our prompts, getting the system prompt. And then there's one that I didn't cover um, that's using some JavaScript. Then you'll see wh where that comes into play as we as we go through and actually build this. So that's located again in this ch this shiny chatbot folder. So so the, the main, main page, shiny chatbot. And then we have these helpers. Um, the final app is in app.r. The app with extensive comments is in app with comments. So you can see all of that here. And then again, I'm I'm starting from this app start here file. Okay, so with this framework, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and run the app. And there's a whole lot of nothing right now, just a blank box. If you, if uh, what I did there was I hit command shift enter on a Mac, I think it's control shift enter on Windows. I have it set to run in the viewer pane. Again, this is under the settings that we have up here. Run in viewer pane and run in the, uh, in the as a background job. This is quite convenient as we make changes. All we have to do is, is hit uh, those that hotkey again. For, for me, it's command shift enter and the app will, re will reload. All right, what we're gonna be using for this is, uh, this is mostly, the, the overall structure here is 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 uh, heavily using the BS lib pa package that makes takes an existing structure of a shiny app and gives it a nice modern theme um, that I think looks looks quite professional once once we're done with this. We're going to be using cards. Uh, card the an example of a card is what you see on this on on the app right now. And we can start to go ahead and and fill that out. So one thing that we'll do for this is add a header. And we can just call this chatbot. And I'll do my best to um, rerun the app every time we make some some changes so that you can see this as we go along. Uh, there were a couple of different input fields that we had before. Uh, the first was a um, password input. And we'll just call this API key um, and maybe something like enter your open AI key. And again, we'll just do enter. And I forgot a comma. 
Okay, so now we can just paste keys in here. The next piece of input that we had was one that would allow us to select the model. So we'll just do a select input model. And I'll just say select open AI model, something like this. Oh, it's because it wants, <laughs> got an error there. It wants choices. So we'll say the two most prop popular models are GPT 3.5 turbo and GPT four turbo preview. And there we go. You'll notice that it automatically selected the first one from the list that we gave it. I'm just going to check and make sure that those were the, yep, that looks right to me. Um, one piece that I want to emphasize. If you have not created an open, open AI account yet, I just rendering that page that I shared before, please go to, you can click here. You can go to this open AI panel and follow these instructions to go ahead and get started. You need the critical piece is that you need to add your open AI API key as an environmental variable. This will allow you to actually make the, the open AI calls. It won't be as fun if you, if you can't do that. Um, I do know that we had an, an, uh, some bug reports back when we were originally developing the GPT studio package that you might have to add payment information in order to for your API key to work. I don't know if that's still true or not. Uh, so you might actually have to enter that in there. Um, based off what we're doing today, we you probably won't even spend a penny, literally. You, like it'll be very, very little cost, uh, but do be aware that you could incur a small cost from following along uh, with, with some of this. Okay. So let's go back into the app. The last thing, the last option that we want to have here is um, we could do select input again, and then we want to have a uh, task. Remember, we had two task options. The choices were general and code. And you see that I love to forget commas. Okay, um, I would prefer that we don't have to interact with these dropdowns every single time. This is taking up a bit too much uh, screen real estate uh, from us so far. And one way that we can get around that is by using a BSLib feature called a popover. So let me show you what that can look like. It's this popover uh, element, and I'm just gonna surround the three in inputs that we had with this. One of the nice features that we have um, with the popover is we can use icons to, for this to look a little bit nicer, I would say. And what I'll do for this, yeah. Okay, so the popover has the inputs and I, I apologize, I did not mean to include the card header in here. So I'm gonna have to re, I'm gonna have to move this around a little bit. Okay, so within the popover, we have a trigger. And for the trigger, we're gonna use an icon. And the output of, you can just see what this looks like if I actually have the package loaded, sorry about that. So that function just produces this this look this icon there looks like a gear makes sense, um, and let's run the full app again. Okay, so you notice that now that we have this popover, we can click this and this shows up for us. It's a I think a little bit cleaner way for us to interact with the settings here, especially if you're not going to change them every time. And I actually don't want them to be positioned right here. 
So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to make it part of our header. So I'm just going to move this down here. Try to line that up for us, make this a little bit wider. And then we'll run this one more time. OK, so now this is part of the header. You can click this here. And I actually don't like that the gear is right next to the chat bot. So this is uh, something that I have to go and look up. I don't just know this off the off the top of my head um, is we can use some class information that goes as part of the header. And oops, I put that on the wrong line. And now I'm getting confused by my own code. OK, let's come back to that. I also want to give this. Um, Oh, that's because that is not where I want it. Excuse me. Sorry about that. So we're going to, I'm going to also give this a title. So chat settings. A tip that I have here, by the way, is, is it, it can be quite easy to get lost in all of the um, commas and parentheses that you have. If you align the code, so if you see me when I go like this, and then I just, I hit control I, that just aligns everything for me. If you see a funky alignment down at the bottom, that's usually a sign that something is, is going a little bit awry. Okay. And then I think I forgot one component here, which is a, another class argument for our icon. There we go. Um, again, these, these components are not things that I have memorized of how to like throw in the class op, uh, uh, arguments for these different components. It's on the, the BS lib documentation page that can help, um, help structure this overall. OK, so this is looking pretty good. Just run it one more time to make sure everything's working here. This, All these inputs seem to be working OK. All right, so now we have the expected inputs. We have a, our basic card header. Now what we need to do is actually give this thing a um, uh, a chat bot or a, or a text, in, text input field uh, to interact inter interact with the model. So we can do text input, or we can do text area input. Depending on which one you, you have for this is, de is depending on how much text you expect the users to come in and put in here. If it's going to be a lot, you, it's probably a good idea, idea to do text area input. We'll call this prompt. Um, most people know what to do with one of these, so we're not going to give it. I'm What I'm doing here is setting the label equal to null. We want the value to be something like ask your question. Sorry, that's not, we would want that to be a placeholder. And we can just run this to make sure we're, yep. Okay, so now we have a chat bot here or box here for input. Seems to work okay. All right. And I'd like for this to be a little bit, I'm going to set width equals to 100%. All right, that's looking a little bit better. 
we can type some text in here. And now we need it actually a button to send this, send this information off to the model. For this, we can use an action button and we'll call this uh, chat. And then for a label, we'll do null again for icon. Um, the, oh, what is it called? I think it, is it paper plane? I want it to look like a paper plane. I'm trying to remember if it actually is. Nope, maybe send. Doesn't like that either. Hmm. Oh, sorry, we can do this. I'm forgetting my syntax a little bit. We can do this in the label. There we go. Okay. So this is a bit, this looks a little bit ridiculous, I'll say. Uh, the button is is quite giant. Um, we're going to use another one of these classes, just button dash primary. Makes it a little bit more colorful. Um, we'll give this a margin, a margin of one, m dash one. Um, give it a little bit of room. Okay. What I really would like, so this this would work, right? I mean, you could you could type your 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 question in here, and you could click this to chat. That's fine, um, but I'd I'd really like them to be side by side. One of the ways to do that is with a fluid row, and just for organization's sake, I'm gonna space my code out a bit. And we need to add a column for each of these. If you're new to Shiny, this might be a little bit, um, this might be a little bit strange, but oops. And for each of these, we'll need a width. So let's say width is out of 12. I, I don't know why 12, but that's <laughs> that's what it is. So we'll give this a 10 and a two. And I would have thought that these would be next to each other. Oh, okay, we just need this to be a little bit wider. Um, you'll see if it gets too small, it'll collapse down. So if we make this a little bit wider, that works okay. And please keep the questions coming in the chat. I know I've been talking for a good bit and haven't haven't responded to any of you. So so just yell at me if I if I'm not hearing any of the questions. And one thing that I I just like the style of you know pretty much copying um, the the chat GPT layout is we're going to use the same class that we used above. So this is a, a div. Um, these are very common working with websites. And I'm just going to, yeah, MS Auto. So I'll copy this. Mm, that's not exactly what I was hoping for. Oh, so we have to do a little bit of additional styling. And this is something that I am not fiddling with uh, off the cuff. I, I I did all the fiddling for this when I was originally developing this app. So not something I expect anybody to be able to just produce. Okay. Wants a little more spacing there. Okay, that looks not perfect, but it looks okay. Um, what I was trying to get is have this be more centered. I think what can help is if I set this width to 100%. Make this 
a little bit wider. Okay, I won't mess with the styling too much for this. This is something that we can certainly fiddle with. Um, one of the best ways to style apps is actually to use a theme. And we'll use BS theme. If you want to see what all the themes are, you can do, what is it? It's like BS lib theme boots watch. No theme. Boots watch themes. You, this is where you can see all the, the list of all of the themes that are available. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the one that I used for, oh, not simplex. Pulse, maybe? Uh, oh, got to give it the explicit argument. Okay, so despite the alignment being a little bit, there we go, that looks okay. All right, so this is starting to look like, a, like an actual chat app. I want to constrain the size of the text area input a little bit. Okay, that looks a little bit better. Um, the alignment of the button isn't great, but we can come back and, and tweak the button, the button stuff in a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna pause again for questions before we start getting into some of the server logic. Uh, we're not done with adding components to the to the UI, but we need to go down to the server before we're actually going to do that. Most of what we've shown so far is just orienting the components on the app, and now we can now we can get to to the fun parts. I'd say. Okay. What I'm going to do now is we want to have a response when we click chat. And the way that we'll do that is we'll have an observe. And these observe functions are going to are going to wait for a certain condition to, to get met. And for this, we're actually going to use bind event input chat. Now, if you've been making, if you've write, been writing shiny apps, you might be used to this structure, input chat, something like that. Um, I think that the more recent syntax is to use the observe with bind event. And so I'll stick with that for today. And what we want to do is say we have a prompt. We want to pass that prompt to our chat function. And because change our working directory. Okay. We know that we want Ah, great question. Okay. So, I, I guess all of you can see the chat as well. Speech to text. Um this is a pain. It's a pain to do in shiny. Um it's a pain to do uh off to get additional input types for um, to to use in shiny apps, I haven't actually found a great solution for this. The best thing that I can come up with is, and I don't know if this will work when I'm actually sharing, is um, I guess it won't, but is to use the built-in speech recognition on my Mac. Uh, I assume Windows and, and Linux have similar utilities. I I haven't I've tried to get it to work where you could just record and it would it would it would do um, speech to text but I haven't got a great shiny solution for that. Um, so if any of you are friends with the shiny development team, maybe that's something you could push their way to see if there's a if they have a solution in mind. Great question though. Okay, so we have this component. So chat user message equals input prompt. So that's what we have up here. 
And we can see what other components that we have in here. So model, again, this is just all I'm pulling from here is the helper file. So all of these components that we have in here. And it's very similar to the what I was talking through on the slides. So input model, history. Okay, so how are we gonna handle our history? Um, Let's come back to that. For now, I'm just going to set this as null. But we don't want to. We we don't want it to stay that way, um, because we we need it to. If if we don't have a history, you ask a second question, it's going to answer it as if it had no idea. Okay, so we have another helper function for this, which is get system prompt. So system prompt is get system prompt. And we'll do input task. And let me check on how I actually wrote this. It might only need task. Ah, OK, sorry about that. I actually use these in the function. So all we need to do is, is show the task, and then it's going to create that for us. So we don't, don't need to pass the full um input task okay and then the next is input api key all right so this should work what i want to do is just test it out And we can actually do this first thing we'll do before we actually bother with the key is I'm going to use the CLI package. Or we don't even need to. We can just do this. this. Uh, I forget the message. Maybe we can just do that. I forget if Shiny actually picks that up. And it is not doing anything. Let's try with C. Oops, that's because it was in the wrong spot. I'm just wondering when all of you see the uh, coding errors, how many of you are yelling at your screen when uh, before I run my code? Let's try this again. Let's try this with a cat statement. All I'm looking to do is to see if the button actually works at this point. Okay. All right. I <clears throat> I was confused before because um, it needed to switch over to the background tab to actually get the output coming from this. Um, so good, good news is our button works. We click this and you can see something happens over here. Bad news is the uh, chat call isn't actually working. And the reason it's not working is because we haven't given it an API key. So two things that we want to do for this. Number one, we need to give it an API key. But two, it would be good for us to have um, some check as to whether or not the API key has been uh, entered. And for this, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take, take this really as a helper function um, so I'm copying this over from the other file. And what we're doing here is we're checking, do you have an API key or is it just set to nothing? And if it's not, it gives you instructions on what to go do. So let's load this again. Okay. So um, it would help if we actually had... So what we're doing for this is we've rendered this UI. And we need to give it the output up here. So what we'll do is we'll go above our um, the above our div that we had before. And we're just going to say UI output uh, instructions. 
and we'll load everything again. Okay, so now what this has is it's, we have some instructions of what to do once you first encounter the app. This is quite nice because if you actually need them to, if you need the user to go do something, um, this will make sure that they they can see that and can take action on it before before you go and uh, before they go and try to try to use the model. Okay. Another condition that we might want to check for. So right now you can say, okay, yeah, it's not working. It's not working. Um, we don't we we don't have. Um, uh, we we would prefer that it doesn't actually make the API call if it doesn't have an API key because we know that will fail every time. So what we can do for this is we can have a a, a rec or a requirement, uh, and we'll say input API key does not equal the empty parentheses. And what we should see from this is that nothing happens now when we click this, and now that we when you think about this, this actually makes sense. Uh, or there's another condition that we would want to add, which is not sending an empty prompt. So we can actually say input prompt does not equal this uh, empty character string. And so even if I have, so if I run this again, even if I put something in here and make that error go away, oops, not what I want to do. If I don't have anything in here, it's not going to do anything when I click the button. If I add something, now it'll try to do it, and we're getting a warning about our request failed. And that's because I didn't put a real API key in here. OK. The next next piece that we want to we want to have here is um, to actually render our overall um, uh, the chat stream that we have coming out from this. So this is where we need to now actually include some history. Um, we're going to use some reactive values for this. And we could say chat history. And we'll initialize that to null. Okay. And what we want to do now is the chat history. We're going to use another one of our helper functions, update history. Great question. So, can you do we do you need a new API key every time? Absolutely not. So, I use I reuse API keys all the time. If you are making this for just you, you're making it for yourself, you're maybe you want to make a chat bot for somebody at work and it's okay for them to use the same account that you are, you actually could go ahead and and store the key as an environmental variable if you wanted to. So, one way that you could do this um is use edit our Byron, and I'll say project. And then you could just set in here, open AI, API key, put your API key in there. I'm not going to save this file, but you would save it, reload your session. And then you could actually just change this to sys.get in open AI API key. And you could do that here or in the actual function definition as well. Um, that This is covered. Um, I think decently well in the GPT tools documentation or in the setting up your account. One using these environmental variables is a really nice way to make it so you don't have to set this every time. Okay. So for this update history, we have history, user message, and response for each of these. Oops, sorry about that. And now what we need to do is this is going to construct our entire chat history. Now we're ready to actually create another output. And I'll just call this chat history. Render our UI. We'll put a check in here to make sure that the chat history isn't null. 
So this is like the initial condition that we have. If we don't have anything here, uh, we would prefer not to in, um, render anything. And we're gonna add another card here. So the card ends up being um, the where all the, all the chats will appear um, for the user. And what we wanna do is go th through this chat history object is gonna be a list. And I know I'm probably going a bit fast here um, where it might be difficult for you to follow along on your own, but I wanna make sure we end up leaving plenty of time for questions. And I wanna show you how to deploy this thing. Okay. Okay, so what I just wrote there is we have this chat history. It's gonna go through each element. It's gonna pull out the role. It's gonna make it bold. And then it's gonna have the content there. Okay. Make sure I didn't break anything. Looks like I did. Um, it's upset about something. Oh, I think I need values. Yeah. Sorry, this is a nuance that we won't have time to get into today, but use reactive values um, for what I was just showing you. And that should that should work well. Okay. Um, let me grab my key to put on my clipboard so I can paste it in. Okay, and we will test it out. And I'll just say, hello there. Okay, well, we didn't get an error, but we also didn't get any output. And that's because I forgot to do anything with the chat history. <laughs> so we'll just come back up here. Uh, I'll put this right below the instructions, UI output, chat history. Don't forget your commas. Okay. Copy in my API key, say hello. And there we go. And I'll say, please introduce yourself. And we're getting quite rapid responses. So this is from, this is coming directly from GPT 3.5 Turbo. It's quite a zippy model. Uh, let's make sure some of these other features are working. So I'm going to change it over to code. And I'll say, show, oops, show me how to create a simple ggplot. It's taking a little bit longer this time. Taking quite a long time <laughs> to come back. Um, while we're doing that, something else I want to add here is, uh, there it goes. So you can see it was being wordy on us. Um, plenty of good information there. And now the next thing that we want to do is make it so that at once the model returns a response, we want to uh, make it so that the text area input that we had um, goes back to being effectively nothing. So the syntax for this is we just need to we, we're specifying our current session, our prompt. So this is the input ID, and then we want the value to be nothing. So basically, it's empty. And then we'll have a placeholder, if I can spell, ask another question. All right, so you don't have to wait. I'm going to change this again to 3.5 turbo, go to code, 
show me a fun ggplot2 example. Make this a little wider. There it goes, much faster this time. And what I want to do now um, is, well, you noticed I kept hit, hitting enter, expecting it to send a response back. That's where we have this helper function. Um, I've dug into the JavaScript or really asked ChatGPT to dig into it. So we can just take this, copy that, put it at the top of our app. So press enter to chat. And now adding in the API key. So you can see it's tedious to add the API key every time, but I'll say hello there. And I'll just hit enter. And now we get a get a response. I must have, oh, it's because I copied the, I didn't have the API key on my clipboard anymore. Let's try that one more time. Hello again. And there it goes. Now it's working. Okay, so this is pretty close to, I would say, a uh, minimal app. I still don't love the the alignment uh, that we have going on at the bottom. I'm looking at our, I'm pulling up our uh, example app and I'm not seeing exactly where we went astray. So if anybody else sees it and I'm just being blind, please let me know. Nothing obvious there. Well, I'll probably uh, figure it out <laughs> once we get off the call, um, but that's okay. That happens sometimes. Okay, so this is a pretty minimal app uh, or, or functional app. Like, right? You can you can ask questions. You have a chat bot that's coming here. Um, it's it's. It's a, it's a chat interface that you have inside the RStudio IDE. Next question you might have is, okay, let's, let's go and deploy this. Um, I have a pretty minimal slide to go share for this, but, it ha but I have some cool pictures to share. So I'll swap back over just briefly. I forgot to click the timer to see how long we were actually going. Um, <clears throat> but the three main options that we have for deploying these, the number one option is going to be shinyapps.io. I'll show, I'll actually show an example of how to do this. Um, we can talk about hugging face as a deployment option. I have a, a video on my YouTube channel about this. I should have linked the YouTube channel. Um, so I'm actually going to do that right now. So I think it's YouTube. Let's see if that was right. Nope. Different James Wade. View your channel. Okay. So this should work. I haven't made videos in a while, but I plan to quite soon. So if you're interested in, in learning more, hopefully that link works. Um, maybe that. There we go. That one, this one definitely works. Okay, so uh, shinyapps.io, hugging face, and then posit connect. If you have access to posit connect, this is far and away the easiest one. This is the one you should use, ignore the other two. If you don't have posit connect, encourage your employer to buy it because it's fantastic. I use it every day. Um, I, I literally make probably three or four deployments a week, just because of how easy it is to put stuff up there. Um, it's really, really, really a great tool. But if you don't, shinyapps.io is a, is a really good option as well. Okay, so what we'll do for this is, it's pretty simple to do this. I'll click publish. I've already connected my shinyapps.io account. Um, you do have to come in here and, and add a, you have to create, a, of course, a, an account there. You have to add a key in. The instructions are pretty good for this. I think I also have a video on that too on my on my YouTube channel as well. And I'll say fun chatbot. Oops, fun 
chat bot. And that was, yeah, I'm glad that failed because I that was not at all what I should have done. I I selected way too many files. When you come in here to here to do this, you only need to select the files that we actually use. So the main file that we were in, and then we have a helper file as well. Ah, okay. This is a weird bug that you'll get sometimes. It tells you that your project must not contain both a file app.r and a single file shiny app. That's a ridiculous error. It's because it doesn't like deploying from a background job. Um, but you'll notice that this little symbol here are kind of the, oh, thank you for pointing that out. You didn't get to see me make all my mistakes. All right, so hopefully you're seeing the good screen again. Um, what I'm doing here, this is the sort of magical button uh, when it comes to deployments. You'll see this here. And then we, when we run this, you see it up here as well. Um, clicking from here, I'll say fun chatbot. And then I'll select these files. So the apps start here. That's what we've been editing this whole time. And then we were loading some of these helper files. I might get an error. Yeah, so, <clears throat> oh, I did the same thing. I told you not to do the, the thing that I did, and then I did it again. Okay. I wonder if it's upset because I have multiple app files that are actually in here. If anybody's following along, I'll be curious if you got the same error that I did. I do know that I'm at my limit on number of free apps that you can deploy to shinyapps.io. But the typical experience is that if you click the magical publish button, select the files that are that you want to include, it works quite well. I lost my chat window. Okay. Hopefully th those <clears throat> comments about only seeing the slides are old and you did see me deploy it. Can someone confirm you did see me click the deploy button? Good, good. Okay. So what you're seeing here, <clears throat> as soon as I swap windows, a screen popped up on its own right here. And here is our deployment. I don't think I still have my API key here, but we'll see if we do. I'll say hello. Yeah, so I, I just didn't have, I don't have my API key on the clipboard. Um, where did it go? Let's just make sure that this is in fact working. There it goes. So show me how to use ggplot2, be brief. All right. Okay, and if we go over to just my account on shinyapps.io, so I'm just on the main landing page, click dashboard to go and sign in. And I have a couple of other ones that are deployed here. The PDF chat example that we were talking about, you can also see that it is deployed. So if you want to use it, use that, you can go and, and do that here. And then the other, um, let me open this up. So again, 
you connect your account, you click publish button, select the app.r file and any helper files that you want, and then you're off to the races. Good. Ah, so it's possible that I have an error in the app with comments. Um, I, I see that somebody got an error running running the app. Can you try that with the app.r file? That should work since that the one that's the one that we just deployed. I did see a, there was a question I think about asking about number of tokens used. Um, we don't have any logging for that, unfortunately. Uh, I will say that the GPT 3.5 Turbo, the GPT 3.5 Turbo model is so cheap that it almost doesn't matter. I can go show you my own usage. Usage. And you can see that I've been playing with, with a couple of different apps today and effectively we've spent five cents. I, I uh, wish I would have reset this and used a different API key so we could see exactly how much we were spending, um, but it's it's quite, quite low. The 3.5 turbo model. So I, I use this, the API fairly heavily and you can see my monthly spend that we have here. It's not, it's not very high. Um, now, it, fortunately, because I'm using this in a research role uh, professionally, I'm not the one on the hook for this. So for some of you, um, you might be very cost sensitive and don't want to end up incurring any cost at all. Um, if, if that's the case for you, then I would actually highly encourage you to look at Olama. This is a way to run models locally. So completely free, completely local. And there is support for running local models within GPT Studio. So some instructions for how to get started are on this page. I'll throw the link to this in the chat. Okay, so I want to jump back over to 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 deployments. I opened too many windows, so I got to go find my slides. Uh, hugging face is is a great um, option. It's a little more complicated to to actually go and deploy there. Again, I have a dedicated video on that, um, but this is another free option for deploying shiny apps. It deploys into a container. Uh, whereas compared to shinyapps.io, I actually don't know what the back end of Shiny Apps does, but I know that Hugging Face will deploy into a container. So you you have to you have to mess with things like Docker files uh, a little bit. So if that's if that's a new concept for you, I would stick. I would encourage you for now to stick with shinyapps.io. So I'm happy to uh, explore. We have, we have some time remaining. I'm glad I left time for for, for that um, for for some questions. We can dive into that. PDF chatbot if you're interested in that as well. Um, I can show you maybe how to some GPT tools or GPT Studio, something like that. Okay, so please let me know what what do you want to see more of? Ah, great question about the deployment. I think shinyapps.io it is it is um, a it is public by default, but the uh, you can make it private that might be a pro feature i'm actually not sure about that let's try it i see the question about um the exporting to excel could you maybe describe a little bit more about the use case because i think we might be able to solve it in a different way um Okay, so let's just go into the PDF chat example, into the settings, um, users. So I can set this as private. Um, it looks like I'm not sure what the private is actually doing. 
if you upgrade, it looks like you're, you have the ability to, to be a little bit more specific about that. Um, one of the, one of the security measures for this is, isn't like real security, but it's security by obscurity. So if it's a random URL, um, it's unlikely that ran, random people on the internet will end up stumbling across it, but you certainly would want to be careful about, about just sharing this, sharing this with others. If you're going to include the API key, if you're not including an API key, then there's not too much risk, uh, because it's not going to cost you anything, but yeah. Okay, so I see a question, a couple of questions about the uh, PDF ingestion. Um, yeah, let's let me show you how it works. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do for this is we have to read in a PDF document. Super easy. You just use PDF tools, and there's a PDF text function. So you read in the PDF text, you pass this to read lines, and then I do a little bit of cleanup. So I, uh, you just get um, individual lines that I collapse together, and then I remove, um, this is a complicated string, of, but I'm just removing repetitive periods and spaces. Um, and this was trial and error. So I got some weird results from the PDFs and that, that, helped, that helped clean it up. There's likely some even better tools for this, but this is just what I got working off the cuff. The question about, embeddings, um, am I using them, is absolutely yes. So that's that's how this ends up working. Um, I'm using some helper functions that are from GPT tools, where I chunk the document up into, into individual pieces of about 400 words. So this is token size, but um, that's a bit, bit beyond what we what you probably care about for this. But this is a this is a helper function. It's a little bit nasty, um, to be honest, because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's probably cleaner ways to do this, but what it does is it chunks it up and then it uses a function to add the em embeddings that's down here. Um, and I'm using OpenAI embeddings for this. You might've heard about vector data stores or vector databases and all that fun stuff. <clears throat> I don't use any of that. I just put this in a tibble. And then you can use that tibble to do vector lookup. Um, a lot of this stuff can sound complicated um, where you're you're generating these immense vectors. It's like more than a thousand dimensional space that you're trying to do um, like vector proximity for. Uh, but in practice, like if you actually want to do this, all you do is you store your vectors in a tibble. You do cosine similarity. There's a single function. Um, in order to do that, that's part of this buried in here. Um, so the 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 primary way that this works. Let me close these other files because they they share the same name, so it can be confusing. What you do for this is you create an embedding. You take your index, and then from this index, so that's that's the tibble with embeddings you do this lookup to find the number of uh, entries that you want to include as context within your model. So you take the embedding of your question, match it up against the embeddings of your index, and then you directly provide that as the prompt to your model. It, oops, it's a, maybe a somewhat naive approach, but I found it works quite well. I don't, again, I don't mess with vector databases. I just pass the context to the model. LangChain is not available in R. Um, however, I bet it would work quite well with Reticulate. Uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with LangChain, this is a, a tooling that allows you to, to add features like uh, vector data stores to do chaining of prompts. That's where the chain in LangChain comes from. Um, yeah, so that, that, as far as I know, people have not written a wrapper around the LangChain package, but it would be, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very useful tool as well. Let's see any, I don't think there's any other helper functions that I, I didn't mention before. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we go from, there is a module that I add for this. So this is the sidebar that you saw. So let me actually open the app so you can see it. Yeah, so I had, I had a module to, to load this in, but all it is is you have a file reader, 
and then an action button. That action button, all it's doing, so ingest PDF, it goes to this and runs that function. Quite simple. And I think if you, so if you were interested in um, that, that Excel export, um, probably the best way to do that would be to manipulate the, oops, the chat history object that we're creating. So that would have, you'd have to do some parsing on that, but um, that would give you the, all of the answers that you, that you're likely looking for um, from the, from the Q and A for this. What else? I'm happy to stick around and, and answer more questions if you have them. As soon as I leave here, I get to go and start changing diapers and feeding babies. So you're you're I'm happy to hang around for a little bit. Please don't hesitate if you have more questions to ask to James. And if you have any, um, if, if after this, you'd like to, to ask more questions about this, feel free to create an issue on the GitHub page. Um, if you know how to, like if, if you find me on any social media, feel free to message me there. Um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to, uh, I'd ha be happy to connect. And if you have any YouTube video requests, uh, since I should be getting back in the business of making them soon, I'd, I'd love to have, have suggestions for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. You can have to, to ask for a summary of the PDF, but that it, it'll be great at doing something like that. So I think we don't have more questions, I suppose. Thank you, James, so much for this amazing workshop. Please don't hesitate to let us know yeah, you can send also us an email if you, after this workshop, you remember some questions. So we can, Absolutely. yeah. And thank you everyone for attending our workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Arle Gizrom. Thank for, you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, James and everyone. Oh, and have I, a, I, yeah. I do have one question for you. So I kept asking Copilot to, to incorporate symbols and themes from Tunisia and Rome. Did it did it do anything close to a good job? Did were, were there recognizable images that you saw? Yeah, actually I think the <laughs> image you put Absolutely. like yeah Tunisia, I think yeah it looks like Tunisia during summer, you know. Not winter, <laughs> but at least yeah it's close. A little uh, bit close. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> And thank you, thank you. So have a wonderful Saturday. Enjoy your weekend and we see you next month. Thank you. Have a great one, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.